Can everybody hear me okay in the chamber? A little louder would be I nice. Say anybody, but we're yes. here. Okie doke. Aguajito Oaks. Alta Mesa. Here. Casanova Oak Knoll. Here. Deer Flats. Here. Del Monte mm -hmm. Beach. Here. Del Monte Grove Laguna Grande. Here. Downtown. Downtown. Kurt, you think you're muted? Here, my my shift key wasn't working. Sorry. Not to, no worries. Thank you. Fisherman Flats. Here. Glenwood. Here. Monterey Vista. Here. New Monterey. Here. Oak Grove. Here. Old Town. Here. Skyline. Hello. Hello. Okey doke and Villa Del Monte. Here. All righty, Rick. Okay, great. Uh, um, you want to go ahead and read the thing that you need to read every time? Yes. Uh, welcome to the May 5th meeting of the Monterey Neighborhood and Community Development Program, NCIP, oh, Improvement Program. We encourage members of the public to join our meeting via Zoom Gov, which is a secure service for use by government agencies. Joining on Zoom is preferred because there is no lag time when you are connected to the meeting. However, this meeting is also streamed live on youtube.com forward slash city of Monterey with a delay of approximately 10 seconds and on Comcast channel 25 with a delay of up to 90 seconds. If you plan to make a public comment, please join using join the meeting using Zoom Gov on the app or by telephone, making sure you join in time to accommodate the delay. To join the meeting from Zoom on your computer or phone, use the link or phone number on the agenda at isearchmonterey.org. Since this meeting has already begun, you'll find the agenda under the recent tab. To join by telephone, dial 833-568-8864, that's a toll-free number, and enter webinar ID 161-843-6636 and the pound symbol. And if prompted to enter a participant ID, press the pound symbol or hashtag. This information is available at the top of tonight's agenda in the red text and details, detailed instructions on using Zoom are also available at monterey.org forward slash public meetings. To make a public comment, please raise your hand using Zoom, or if you are connected by phone, dial star nine to raise your hand, then star six to unmute yourself. Public commenters will be muted until it is their turn to speak. We ask that public commenters turn off TV or computer speakers or go to another room while connected to the, by phone as any background noise will interfere with the broadcast. Each public speaker will be called on in the order that their hands were raised. The chair has designated a three minute time limit for today's meeting with a countdown timer shown on the screen, I believe. If you are connected live on Zoom, the timer is accurate with no delay. Please stay within your time so that you won't need to be cut off. Thank you, and we look forward to receiving your public comments tonight. That's great, and just for, for the public, I'm Rick Corey, I'm the chair, I'm actually be running the meeting remotely. Uh, and just for those of you in the conference, in the council chambers, I can see who is at the dais, but I will not be able to see who is in the Public, if we have anyone there to speak. So if someone in there uh, in the council chambers can help when we come to that, it would be great. Okay, next item on the agenda is public comments for anyone. Uh, it's the time for anyone to address the NCIP on any matter that is not on tonight's agenda, but is, and is within the purview of the NCIP committee. Uh, you'll have three minutes. Uh, is there anyone in the council chambers who wishes to speak under public comments? Yes, we have one. Okay, if they could come to the dais and introduce themselves. 
Hello, my name is Carrie Ann. I was the creator and founder of the Monterey Police and Fire Honor Garden before COVID hit. I have sat back with many people and were saddened when things happened and things were changed and taken away from our very supportive and um, police and fire departments. So I just wanna tell all of you that when I received that letter in the mail last week that said, we're up for consideration again. I, I literally broke down. Um, it means a lot to me as someone who was born and raised here. Um, parents lived on Del Monte Beach. I went to Del Monte School. I have my grandmother who used to work in the old St. Carlos Hotel washing dishes and used to throw me down the conveyor belt in a bucket so I could have ice cream with the dishwashers. I love this community and I love what our police and fire department do for us. As I was driving here, I, there, were, there was an ambulance and another fire truck taking off. And I just think, you know, so unselfishly, they give of themselves, not knowing what they're coming up against. And that's even the fire de uh, police department, but not even knowing what they're approaching in that house, in that environment. They're there to support us. And I just really appreciate your consideration and thoughts for putting this back on and being able to consider this project again, because I sincerely feel when people drive by and they see this beautiful corner, they're gonna stop and think about how lucky they are that they live here and they're there to support us as well. Thank you very much this evening. Okay, and thank you, ma'am. Uh, it's actually on the agenda tonight, so. Oh, uh, no, I was the only one here, I didn't know what was. That, that, that's okay, so we'll take those as the comments that you would have been making later on in the evening. Okay. And I don't. I don't stay then, right? Do I stay? Yeah. You don't have to if you don't want to. Thank you so much. Thank you. Everyone. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Is there uh, any el anyone else in the council chamber? No. Nope. Uh, I am not seeing any hands raised in the general public on Zoom. So seeing none, I uh, will move on to the first agenda item, which is uh, approval of the minutes. Does anyone have any additions, changes, comments, or anything else related to the minutes that, that are in the packet? Um, I actually do, Rick. Okay, Alyssa. So I actually realized I left a sentence out for a public commenter. Um, so on the third page of the minutes, um, about mid-page down, it has the public commenters. And I left out prior to John Sovereign, there should be a sentence that says, Clementine Bonner Klein spoke in support of her nominated project, MV16. Okay. Uh, anyone else have any changes or additions to make to the minutes? Not, I'll entertain a motion for approval as amended. I move that we approve the minutes as amended. I believe that that was Dennis. That was Dennis, yes. And seconded by who? Lay Whitney from, from Glenwood. Okay. Uh, is there any further discussion, discussion on the minutes? Not uh, Alisa, can we have a roll call, please? Okie doke. Alta Mesa? Aye. Casanova Oaknoll? Yes. Deer Flats? Yes. Del Monte Beach? Aye. Del Monte Grove Laguna Grande? Aye. Downtown? Yes. Fisherman Flats? Yes. Glenwood? Yes. Monterey Vista? Yes. New Monterey? Yes. Oak Grove? Oak Loose. Grove? Loose? Yes, I wasn't on yet. Okie doke. And then Old Town? Yes. Skyline? Aye. And Villa Del Monte? Yes. All righty, Rick. Okay, motion carries. The minutes are adopted. Uh, the next item are information reports, which there aren't any in our packet. Uh, Tom, do you have anything you wish to bring up at this point? There are a couple of very brief announcements. One is just a <coughs> reminder that the anti-harassment training is due by June 30th for everyone. Last time we met two weeks ago, um, the question was raised about if you had done it um, under the CERT program before within the last two years, 
would that apply toward this? And we got confirmation from the HR department. Yeah, yes, in fact, you don't have to do it two times. Um, you've done the training, so you're you're set for this period. Um, that's Tom. Yes. Is there a link that we can do it online? Yes, and that information should have been sent to you, April. So we'll make don't. sure that I, I I didn't receive it either. So okay. We'll, we'll, we'll inquire okay. of HR, but yes, it's an online training. It's about an hour. Um, and, and let us know if you have okay. any, we'll make sure that gets out. Um, then um, just a second thing, um, what have I got here? We've been, uh, oh, compiling information for the, the neighborhood representatives and alternates um, for the projects that are proposed. Um, next week we would, we'll, our, Goal is to send you out everyone um, just in, for your neighborhood, which projects um, you will need to get signatures for and things like that. So uh, we mentioned last time, I believe that um, for street lights, we need the signatures of all the people who live within 250 feet of the street light. So we will get you the information that you need so that you can go to the, the people in your neighborhood and get that. So that'll be the names and addresses of the current owners of the properties who are affected by that. So that will come out next week. And then also um, sort of related to that, but not really um, just, we have, um, well, we'll be beginning to prepare the conflict maps. Um, so we have the information that's on file um, with the, um, the city clerk from your form 700. Um, and so if anything has changed since then, I think this, there was a mention of the, something had changed last at the last meeting, please let us know so we can get the maps done um, accurately. And we'll be beginning that next week. So if you're, it's, it's, we're looking for addresses of property that you may own um, that could be within a thousand feet of any of the, the projects that are proposed this time. Okay. Uh, thank you, Tom. And I think I was one who made a comment about needing to review what you have for me because I no longer own one of the properties. Yes. Okay. Uh, the next item is then an NCAP spokesperson report. Sorry, Dennis has a, a question. Oh. Go ahead, Dennis. And Jamie. So on that uh, uh, harassment training thing, what we found with the CERT uh, group is that we sent out what the link looks like because typically it was going into people's junk. So I would suggest that Alicia sent that out to us so that we know what link to be looking for. Um, because we did have a problem with our membership um, seeing that as a valid email that they needed to respond to. Thank you. So we sent that out to our group and that helped uh, get a greater participation. And and just to clarify, it's probably too much information, but it will be coming from the HR department, not from Alyssa directly. So um, we'll look into that as well. Thank you. But the outside agency that you guys use, uh, yes. the city uses? Yes. The, one of the emails inviting you to do that comes from them. Okay. So that typically we'll, we were finding goes into the junk pile. Yeah, thank you. We'll, we'll look into that and we'll get an email out explaining the process better. Okay. Will, we also be, will we also be sending out or clarifying the location for the May 19th meeting, the June 2nd meeting? Because my calendar still shows us it's to be determined and my, I have folks that wanna know where to go. It, right now it's scheduled to be here. Um, so if that changes the, the question we have um, to contact the city attorney's office to see about voting night and if we can do that um, in a hybrid format somehow we'll we'll continue to meet here um, if we are unable to do it that way we may have to make other arrangements so that's that has not been determined yet but we're looking into it are the comment meetings going to be hybrid the, the two comment meetings yes. definitely going to be hybrid yes we're expecting yeah at the end of the day it comes down to the governor and his ruling on what's permissible or not so that theoretically could change but as of right now they're hybrid 
Okay, under uh, NCIP spokesperson comments, uh, just a couple of things. One is the last meeting we had a discussion and we asked for future agendizing. Those projects that did not have funding removed, but are coming up short that need additional funding, be, be agendized at NCIP and we review them and look at using ending balance to fund them or recommend the council use ending balance to fund them. I had some discussions with Tom and others, and that is going to be happening, but we're not certain yet at which meeting. There are a number of other projects. They, they kind of want to make sure they get all of them at one time uh, and bring them to us instead of piecemealing. And they're still determining uh, funding amounts available and is it enough for a few of them. So that will be at one of our future meetings on the agenda. I just want to make sure people didn't realize we that think we had forgotten about it. <clears throat> Second item uh, is the purpose of tonight's meeting for the public. Uh, and just as a refresher for all of us is, this is one of two meetings where NCIP reviews all projects, uh, has information given to them about it. It's our chance to understand them more, to see if there's anything that may not be or a project or has already been done. Uh, it is generally not the, day, the two meetings for public comment on them, although we will hold, allow public to speak on them if they wish to. The actual public ag advocacy meetings for all the NCIP projects will be the next two NCIP meetings as well. So for the neighborhood specific one coverage tonight, we'll do as we did last time, where we'll go neighborhood by neighborhood. Um, we'll do a presentation on the projects, uh, then the neighborhood rep to speak, ask questions, anything, then the rest of the commission, and then we'll go out to the public for each one and then move on to the next uh, neighborhood. There are no decisions being made tonight on these other than if something happens to already be done, it will be noted so that we can take it off of our list. When we get to citywide or community-wide projects, since there's not an actual rep for that, uh, we won't have a neighborhood rep speak to it, but it'll be immediately go to the, to the committee for questions, comments, uh, anything of that nature, then we'll open it up to the public at that point. Uh, so I have nothing else to, to report on other than that. Uh, and so let's go ahead and move on to the tonight's meat of the agenda, which is the actual uh, review of starting point of the projects, beginning with Oak, uh, Oak Grove. All right, Tom? Great. Well, let's get started. I went through again and just uh, had the preliminary slides kind of describing the neighborhoods. Here's our uh, flow chart. And tonight we're doing the second half. It's the first review, which is basically for the NCIP committee members to understand what each of the projects are. Um, and as Rick just said, we'll begin the public um, participation and comment meetings in two weeks. Um, and then following that as well. So tonight we're again reviewing the, the first time through, this would be the second half of the projects. Um, again, there was about 205 projects, 120 were defunded in 2020, 65 carried over from 2020 that they were nominated but never voted on. And there were 20 projects nominated this year. Uh, the neighborhoods, um, in the first half, there were 92 projects. In the second half, there's 105 projects that we'll be discussing tonight. Um, we have, we um, just prior to this meeting, we met with the Museum and Cultural Arts Commission. Um, we received comments from um, the library and museum's director um, that we've included in the slides. And um, we have met with Parks and Rec Commission staff and gone before the Parks and Rec com Commission. Um, and we've also got comments from the Traffic Advisory Committee who met on April 1st to discuss the projects, the traffic related projects. So beginning with the projects this evening, there were three located in Oak Grove. Um, these are the three projects and I'll just kind of slide right through them. Starting now, the first one, is at La Playa and Park Lane. 
It's a pedestrian bike crossing improvements project. Um, this was proposed in 2020. Um, our estimated cost on this one is $75,000. It's an elevated um, ramp for the uh, recreation trail. Um, we did receive comments. I've, I've added since the last meeting, I was trying to look for ways to do this better. And I've added a few comments, or there's a little box on the upper right hand corner of each of the slides now just indicating that we received no comments from Museum and Cultural Arts. We received no comments on this project from the Parks and Rec Commission. And we did receive a comment um, from traffic just indicating that they were generally, they, they did not oppose this, this project. So they're generally in support of it. Okay. Next project is Sloat Avenue, Mark Thomas Drive, a neighborhood sign. Um, we have, uh, we met with the Luz, the neighborhood representative last month uh, to discuss and the idea is to put a sign behind the, you know, kind of on the slope as you're coming around the corner, Mark Thomas is on the right hand side. As you come around before you head under the, the, the freeway there, um, they'd like a sign, like a neighborhood sign there just to alert people are going into a neighborhood and hopefully keep the speed of uh, traffic down. Uh, we figured that would be about a $10,000 project. And then the last one in Oak Grove, the Sloat Avenue, Del Monte Avenue is the bike infrastructure improvements. This project was re, uh, nominated in 2020 and the cost will be, like for a study and design, it will be close to maybe $250,000 um, to actually improve the intersection in a meaningful way will be a lot more expensive than that. Um, what is needed here is actually more right of way. So the traffic advisory committee um, suggested maybe we could change the scope of the project to um, securing or purchasing, obtaining right of way somehow um, that would allow the improvements to be made. If there was enough, the, the, the issue you can sort of see, maybe can't, but on the photo on the right, the sidewalk is very narrow. It's right next to the street. And it's right at the right of way line there. So the city doesn't own the property to the right of the sidewalk. If there were a way to get purchase more property to the right of the sidewalk, uh, we'd be able to add a dedicated left hand turn lane. And um, we could make the sidewalk wider, which would make it easier for cyclists coming down slope and then trying to get over to the rec trail as well. So um, there are a number of issues that need to be addressed with this project, but it's a good project that um, everyone is interested. The traffic advisory committee is definitely interested in uh, pursuing it, but there's it's not a small project. Make sense? Okay. Yes, it does. Thank you. Where is that map to the left? But I, I'm trying to place where this is at. So this is right on Del Monte Avenue, um, the, uh, on the lower right hand corner of the map is um, the Naval Postgraduate School. This is okay. their property. And this is Sloat on here. There's like a, I think it's like called Burrowwood. Okay. Burrowwood is across Europa Design would be on the left at the intersection. Okay. Here, and there's an angle of the street that threw me off. Yeah, and the rec trails across the top. Okay. Thank you. All right, so we'll go to Luz first as the neighborhood representative, Luz. Hi, um, the first project, the one on the um, bike path in La Playa, uh, that one, like we said, it was in 2020, and it really was um, agree that it was very unsafe unless we do some more defined um, signs for people to stop exiting the uh, condominiums, entering the condominiums and crossing to and from the, on the pathway. I'm not sure we have a design and uh, it might work. So I think uh, it will be very crucial 
to address this project and uh, as a necessity. So um, we are all in favor for that in our neighborhood. On the second one, um, it's a sign. It's also a safety issue because we have more traffic and some people think that they can use Zoom uh, on slot. And they turn in from Mark Thomas and from coming from the highway, also on Mark Thomas or exiting the Hyatt house. So when they go in there, I think we just need to have a sign clear enough to tell them it is a neighborhood with families. Okay, they cannot just zoom in and, and that's where they are. So yes, I think, you know, in reasonably we have been asking for this for several locations. So we would like to see that happen. And on the third one, on the third one is more evolved because it really involves a lot of uh, safety the property that the, the people on a bike go from slot across the street, they end up in a property. So that's a problem. So they are not sure how to move around. And they move around, turning right, to take the path to go in, into the, um, to the beach. And um, I guess they said to expand the sidewalk, buy the property, and I understand all this is the assumption for the high cost of 250,000 to over a million. But yes, I think it needs to be addressed somehow in the most practical way. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Luz. Uh, any members of the commission wish to uh, speak to any or ask questions about any of the Oak Grove project? Jamie. It looks like Jamie. Yeah. yeah, just a quick question. Is that a Naval Postgraduate School land that we could negotiate with them or is that private land? It's both actually. So um, looking at the, the map on the left, um, there is like you can see the gray building just above Sloat Avenue. That's privately owned, but then anything east of that property where most of the, the trail is highlighted here, it's the, the bike path. That is Naval Postgraduate School property. So businesses are required to pay for sidewalks in front of or across their properties, aren't they? Isn't that the rule that the city will pay for a neighborhood sidewalk, but the businesses have to pay for their own sidewalks? Um, I don't think it's a sidewalk only. And I don't think the Navy, Navy Postgraduate School will have any objections to cooperate once there is a plan involved because yes a lot of the people that are crossing there to go and do their exercise are from the navy school and we have always tried to work with them and in this case will not be different and maybe i should read the, the comment from the traffic advisory committee um, and just kind of tell you what they stated so here's the comment it says the traffic advisory committee recommends that the scope be expanded due to the proximity of the signalized intersection of Del Monte and Sloat. Improvements will trigger ADA requirements, uh, required improvements at the intersection, and there are right-of-way concerns. This project should include design only. So um, one of the things in discussing this project, uh, we I learned um, from the traffic uh, engineer was just that the uh, postgraduate school is would be interested she believed um, in getting a dedicated left-hand turn lane because there are a lot of accidents at this location um, and if we could work th th she did not feel that getting um, an agreement with the postgraduate school for the it's basically the bike trail um, that's located on their property she didn't think that would be an issue um, because he's spoken with them about this this intersection before. So maybe the, the, the submitter wants to change this to be a design because that could be really big, but it could also save money depending on how the, the Naval Host Graduate School used its land to accomplish this extra turn lane. So, and a study isn't a lot of money. And, and 
That's true. One of the other comments that didn't make it in here too is that if we did have a report or a study that would assist us in getting um, grant funding, you know, for applications, it would be helpful that way too. And I just want to point out that not most of the land that we would be needing would be from the private property owner, not the postgraduate school. So it'd be both. Um, I, ideally, the purchase of that property will be a good step, but we are not finding a good solution for, for that right now. We want the solution for the crossing safely. Any other member of the commission with a question on Oak Grove Project? Comment. Tom? Yeah. Or I'm from uh, Fisherman's Flats. I'm and then I'll be and then I'll be Richard Rosello from Kona afterwards. Aware that the Planning Commission had a proposal before, which was shot down, to uh, build housing at that intersection where the uh, car car uh, tire business is at. So you know, there's been some other proposals that have gone on, and I don't know if it was a property in escrow or if it actually closed. But the original project never went forward to the City Council because it, it violated um, so many uh, different planning things in the city. So this was just last year, as I recall. So, you know, you know this is, okay. I, I, I would be very hesitant to throw money at a study till we found out what was happening with that proposed project. I think we need to have an answer on that. Thank you, Tom. Richard. Yes, uh, the Mark Thomas Spikeway project, that's a Kona project, it actually, for my neighborhood to go downtown, we have two options. And one is to go down Mark Thomas Aguajito and go up Fremont, and there's really no bike lane there. The other option, which we discussed in the beginning, was to turn right at Sloat and then go down to Del Monte. So this project would help our bikeway too, because we have to have a way to get across Del Monte to get to the rec trail. But, but we don't have a lot of options on traveling from my area of town downtown. And uh, the bikeway project we proposed would tie in directly with this room. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, any other member of the committee or, if not, I have a, a couple comments and questions. First, I. I I would recommend Lucy on this one that it start off as a design so that we get something designed and everyone knows what it is and we can get people to buy in and try to get grant funding and get things to happen because uh, it's a lot of money to go for without really knowing what all we'd be getting. <laughs> and then the second question is, is on OG2, uh who owns the land where the sign would go is that caltrans or is that city and i don't well, when, need... sorry when when i met uh with uh, a group to discuss our projects they were not clear about who owns you know the assumption was that caltrans might own that place and they might have to agree to put on a sign. And they seem kind of positive that Caltran will agree, but that wasn't clear. And yes, uh, a study for a minimum of 250,000, uh, it seems a little too high, but I don't know. We need to look into a solution for that. I don't know what the best approach other than, than that, a study. Tom? what would a design for that intersection cost like a full design it probably wouldn't be two hundred and fifty thousand dollars but uh, we can look at that and uh, again the numbers that we have um shown on the screen are just are are at this point just a really and a rough estimate we can get more a better number for that um, prior to um, the next meeting for sure. I think um, the design there is, uh, Tom Rowley was just mentioning that um, there was a project, there were two projects actually before planning. And I think they went to city council about a year ago where people were wanting to develop those as residential 
and the the planning since 1935 i remember the year they just want it all to be commercial over there so they were shot down there are there's no active project um, with that any longer but um they at that time um had a layout of how the intersection could be reworked and that was one of the things that they were willing to offer the city was the right of way to put that additional lane in there so work preliminary work has been done on that already um it would just be a matter it wouldn't be two hundred and fifty thousand dollars i don't believe I get if, you, if we better. could have the actual uh, rough of what a design would cost as an option that way loose would know what what her options are with that and if we could also validate who owns the property where the sign would go just make sure yeah, if it's Caltrans, we can do it there, but we just will have to deal with them. So whether or not that would impact the cost too. Okay. So uh, we're gonna, uh, excuse me. So we are going to kind of wait for the project number three before actually having it as a project. We are gonna no. wait for some options placed by the well, planning commission. No, it, it is a project. It'll be up there. The question is, is it on the board to vote on as a quarter million to a million uh, for building it or as a design of a project there? And Tom is going to get revised, get formal number or numbers for what a design would cost. So you would have a chance to decide which way you want to go. Liz. And also this uh, study will involve the, the Navy school, right? Yeah, it would actually what I suggested was a more of a study than a actual design. So that way everyone can see what would be needed and the Navy would be involved in that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I, I would assume. Huh? Mm. Okay. Uh, I do not see any uh, members of the public with hands up at this moment. Is there any member of the public in the uh, council chambers? Or actually, do we have any public in the council chambers? We do have two members of the public. Okay, good. At least then I'll keep asking then. If there was no one, I wasn't going to keep asking. But no one is rushing forward to the microphone. No one is rushing forward. Okay, to <laughs> then let's move on to uh, uh, the, the next uh, neighborhood, which would be Old Town, I do believe. Yes. And there are nine projects in Old Town um, this year. Here's a list of them. We'll run through them quickly. Um, as you can see, one of the one of the nine has been completed, so we won't discuss that very much. Um, project number one is the American Legion Harrison Street Walkway renovation. It was uh, originally approved in 2015, and there are repairs needed to the walkway. This is a walk that goes between Veterans Drive up to the end of Harrison Street. Um, there's, there's, it's mostly asphalt and repairs, and um, well, April will report on it afterwards. But she walked up there recently, so she'll have more information on it. Um, the second project is at Larkin Park. Um, it's to install swings. Um, in the playground that's over there. This is a playground that we share with uh, Monterey Peninsula Unified School District. Um, and there are agreements that have been discussed, but maybe not finalized. So um, there would be some discussion with MPUSD as well to get the, this in place. Um, the third project is at the same location. It's for um, irrigation and turf renovation on the near the playground area over here. Uh, we spoke with the Parks and Rec staff and um, Louis Marcuso estimated, I think it would be about 100,000 or $125,000 to do all of the, the irrigation. He was familiar with it um, and knows more about it than I do. But um, the fifth project was the Old Town Neighborhood Signs. Um, and they're just looking for a location to put two or three, I believe, um, signs similar to the, I have a photo of the one from Del Monte Grove, Laguna Grande, and they're thinking something like this, or maybe not even that large, but um, we'll hear again from April 
what they're looking for there. Project number six, um, this project was originally approved in 2018. There was, um, I think, $500 that was set aside to identify a parcel within Old Town that could be used to create an accessible park. Um, and so we've kept this on the agenda or on the, the list this year of a nominated project. It's come back because it was defunded um, and have put $2,500 toward that effort this time around. Um, the eighth project was, uh, it's, it was nominated in 2020, but again, never acted upon. So it was for historic lighting throughout the Old Town neighborhood. And um, just, it would be helpful as I was trying to, we were looking at cost estimates for this. I don't know if it's like several lights or, you know, throughout the whole neighborhood. So um, it, the prices would range and depending on the style of lighting as well. I've got a, photos of different types of lighting, some in town and just some from other places. Um, project number nine was the conduit installation pilot program uh, proposed in 2020 for $250,000. And those are the, there's eight actually, well, seven actually um, projects that are proposed this year. Thank you, Tom. Uh, April, do you want to address, ask questions? Let us know your thoughts. Okay. Um, as Tom said, I recently, well, I walk it often, the um, American Legion walkway, and it really needs repair. You know, we, how long ago was it that whole trail up to Veterans Park was funded? Was that back in the 80s? <laughs> so it really needs uh, some work. I know that the Boy Scouts initially started and the wood needs to be replaced. There are only railings on one side, not on the other. And then that only goes halfway up. And then the other half has no railings at all. So if anybody were to fall, <laughs> it wouldn't be pretty. Um, so that one, we really are in favor of getting that uh, renovated and taken care of. Okay, um, the next one on the swings. We've gone round and round with Louie and Jeff on that for several years and never came to any conclusions, or at least we were never told of what was feasible. And so if Louie has any information on what the feasibility would be there, it would be nice because the children who came and spoke to that are now heading into high school. So <laughs> it would be nice if they could see some swings. Um, and yeah, that would just be another good use of, of playground equipment for our kids. The irrigation and turf, I have real hesitancy about that. Uh, when Jeff looked it up initially years ago, we were paying for it in that school district property. They should be paying the water bill to irrigate the turf. We don't really use that whole area. Ours is mostly just the playground and where um, the picnic benches are and basketball courts and stuff. So I don't know. And I remember distinctly Jeff saying, oh, we've been paying the water bill all this time. I, I don't know why. <sighs> so that would be something I would think you want to check out and make sure that if, if we legally don't have an obligation to pay that, um, I don't think we should be. And especially for that much money to be paying for turf renovation. Um, let's see the next one, neighborhood signs. That would be nice. We'd like it. I know we talk about being overloaded with signs, but every neighborhood has at least one or two that say, Hey, down this street or Hey, up this hill where we would put them. I think we'd have to walk and, and sort of decide where the overload is and what would be advisable. I mean, I've had several. And again, you've got them starred several ideas of either going up Jefferson or going up uh, Madison or going up Franklin. I'm not sure where would be the best spot, but it would be nice to have one or two, I think. And let's see, accessible park. I don't know if we want to leave that as amount of money that we have to put aside. Don't we just usually have a fund for purchase of property if it's available? Do we still? Well, there used to be an opportunity buying fund, but that's part of what was defunded. 
Yep, so that's gone. So if somebody were to find a lot and somebody said, oh, yeah, we're willing to sell that for a park, it would have to go through one of our NCIP rounds. Am I correct? Yes. Correct. What you might do with this is change it to be funding an opportunity buying fund again. But oh. then it wouldn't be specific to Old Town necessarily. Oh, all right. Okay. I would that would be a good idea, I think, because we've several friends and I have walked all over and we can't find anywhere that's you know, either there's something like there's that real nice Clara Wooden park up at the top of Harrison, but that's way at the top of the hill. Kids aren't gonna go up there, you know, and there aren't any vacant lots around and, and Jamie and I were talking about there's that one across from the Perry House. But that's part of that whole, there's triple lot there that goes back with an old house and they're not interested in selling it for a park. So um, if we could put that in an opportunity buying, that would be great. Uh, I, I, we'd have to see who, you know, who was the submitter of this because this was a uh, defunded. It was a previous actual project, so. Uh, but if you can see who, you know, who the original submitter was and see about that talk is. to them about, about changing, that would could be doable. Dennis, you have your hand up? Uh, yeah, just a procedural question. I thought the Opportunity Buying Fund, we set aside funds very similar to when we set aside contingency funds uh, oh. initially in voting night saying, okay, we're going to set aside eight hundred and twenty thousand dollars for contingency and a hundred thousand for contingency. We, we could do it that way, but it could also be through a project I, on the wall. Yeah, I don't think it has to be a project on the wall okay. if we unanimously vote. Right. Yeah, okay. it has to be voted on. I, we've it done, would have to be voted on for sure. Yeah, it's, it's it's been a project in the past because I'm submitted it. Mm -hmm. But if if there's room to not make it a project, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I believe we have done that in the past when we're setting a contingency added to. Yeah, but I, I thought we had actually done it as projects, but because I think it was a, there was a specific lot, I think, in Del Monte Beach and a lot in New Monterey that were the the ones. And I think both the neighborhoods got together to say, you know, let's do it as opportunity buying. But there's an opportunity to research that a little more before voting night. Yes, I'd appreciate that because I believe we've actually added to the opportunity buying. Oh, that that I know we've done, but uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure how we created it the last time around. To be honest. So, would we leave this on the list as still a valid project? It is a valid project. So, All right. yes. All right. Um, street same name signs. We've got those already. Now, I understand you sent out letters, Tom, to the people who proposed some of these things and the historic lighting and the conduit installation were both proposed by the same person. Um, I don't know where she had money for the historic lighting. Um, I can contact her and see if she wants to speak for it on voting night or, or when our turn is to uh, have somebody speak on it. Would that be the way to go? Yes. Yes. Okay. And it was just, I was trying to figure out, you know, is it like a handful Where? of lights? Like <laughs> meet the street? Sure is it the whole neighborhood? Or Yeah, I'm not sure either because that could amount to quite a lot of money. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. And then the conduit installation, I understand, is a no go. I'm not the one who proposed it, but when I spoke to the person who proposed it, she says, oh, that's being taken care of under the undergrounding stuff that's going on currently between. I guess our neighborhood in Monterey Vista. So um, there doesn't seem to be any- I think support. there was another undergrounding project and I'm not sure, I thought mm -hmm. that was a citywide project because it was under proposed by both Monterey Vista and Old Town. Oh, this one? Yeah, so I'm okay. actually, I'm surprised by this one. I don't know yeah. if there, there, I believe it is under CW at some point. Uh, okay. I think there were two. There are two. Okay. There was the original one that was the one that you all fought for. And then another year, I think we added more money to it. Mm -hmm. So how do we handle that one, Rick? It's a project. Is, okay. the, is the project submitter withdrawing it? I thought you said I that. If, if the project <laughs> submitter withdraws it, it, it would be gone. Yeah, she just has to tell you she wants to withdraw it. Okay. 
or no or under. Okay, I think that's it then. I'll contact her on those two on OT8 and OT9. Okay. Any members of the uh, committee wish to speak to or ask questions on any of the old town projects? I have a quick, uh, Jamie here, I have a quick input. Um, so I don't want to speak as the expert, but I do volunteer on the board over at the school at Larkin Park. And I've heard the principal say in the past that they strongly discourage swings because they result in at least one broken arm a year, even though they're a lot of fun. So we, I don't know if you want to expand that to be a more general improvement or if you maybe want to talk with the principal first. I think there, the, the, I believe this specific request was for swings and okay. I believe Louis had a solution to it, okay. but I'm not sure. We'd have to talk to Louis. <laughs> Any other committee members wish to ask questions or speak to any of these projects? Okay. I'll just ask CW10 is the other con. I just, and it seems like it's almost identical. Oh, is it? Okay. And I just, I don't know if uh, you think that's really two separate projects. Okay. It's two projects. I remember in two different years we did them. Or at least there was a, I think on the second one, it was the in 2020 and proposed, but not formally adopted. So I'll contact the person who nominated those last two and uh, see if she wants to withdraw them. Okay. Uh, any member, any other member of the committee? I'm not seeing any hands up. I'm not seeing any hands up from general public. Is there anyone in the council chambers who wishes to speak on the Old Town projects? No one is jumping. Okay. <laughs> In which case, it appears that we have a new neighborhood that no one has known about or has anyone involved in, named Ryan Ranch. Yeah. Yes, we do. And, I'm uh, and, and in our there. meeting that we hold afterwards, as we look at the map and things, I think this may be one of the things that needs to be discussed. Yes. Yeah. But. For right now, it's a Ryan Ranch, so there's one project on. There is one project, and this um, project is at the Ryan Ranch Disc Golf Course, the Stinging Jellies. There is a project um, proposed to do ADA and ADA an accessible parking stall and a walkway, I believe, to the first tee over here. And the good news on this one is that Louis Marcuso is aware of this. Um, there is a, a project that has been awarded for construction of that um, separately from NCIP. So probably before voting night, this project will be complete. Okay. Uh, any members of the committee wish to address this project? Any member of the public? Okay, let's move on to Skyline. And the Skyline neighborhood has eight nominated projects this year, uh, <laughs> one of which is a duplicate. Um, so that, I guess that makes it seven. No, that makes it eight. Um, the, the first project is uh, Windermere Lower Canyon. It's the drainage design for the Lower Canyon. It was approved in 2008. Um, the design piece of this, we estimate now, will be about $125,000. The project number three is Windermere for the upper canyon uh, log drop repair. Um, you can see in the photo there have been some, the, the, the log drops were installed in years past and there's been erosion around the, the edges of the, the log drops. So it would be to design and uh, do some repair to those. This was a project that was originally approved in 2011. And we're estimating about $130,000 for that one. The fourth project is the Windermere Lower Canyon. It's a reconstruction project um, proposed in 2012 or approved in 2012 for funding. 
This one today, um, just with the environmental regulations and all, um, is it's really well. It's it could be impossible to get approved. Um, the the gabions that were used in the past are no longer preferred by um, the regional water quality control board for one. So um, the work, as I understood it, was to to build up. Um, and fill a bunch of areas to quite some depths. And um, this is not going to be an approvable project um, at this point in time, based on the, the current regulations of what you can do in and around a, a water course. Project number six is Pine Hill Way, uh, Mar Vista. There's a path that goes between uh, Pine Hill Way and down to Mar Vista kind of it's not along a street, but between a couple of houses, there's um, uplift and cracked sidewalks. And um, this is one that appears to be um, eligible for funding under measure P and S. And we are investigating that right now. Okay. Project number nine is um, Skyline Forest Drive at the bridge, the barriers. This was also called K rail. Um, in the past, but it's it's the um, the walls of the bridge. They're kind of I think parapet walls is what they're called. Whoops, I lost it. Um, but it's to um, clean those up and repair them, and then install anti graffiti um, coating on them to prevent graffiti from reoccurring. There it was approved in 2019, and we figure about twenty five thousand dollars for that work. Um, project number 13 is at Greenwood Rise Circle. There's an island in the middle of the street that is, um, they're requesting landscaping for that island. Uh, when we met with Parks and Rec staff, um, Louie again said, oh, they have funding. There's an assessment district for the neighborhood um, that would fund this project. So they did not support this application and we haven't put um, any funding toward it on this one. Project number 14, um, Skyline Forest Drive, they're asking for traffic signs near home and highway. Uh, one was a no U-turn. The, the photo on the right is actually looking southbound toward um, home and highway. And uh, apparently you can see how the shoulders look wider over here. People uh, must be pulling U-turns over here. So the traffic advisory committee did not support this application. Um, they're concerned with sign clutter at the intersection and are, are unsure of the need for any additional signage um, in this area. One of the points that was made is it's, it's illegal to pull a U-turn in the middle of a street. So putting a sign there to say that was, was it needed? It was, it wasn't maybe necessary. Um, project number 15 was at the Skyline Forest, the entry signs, they're asking uh, them to be repainted over here. And uh, this is something that uh, we haven't discussed with Louis about, but I'm wondering whether this is something that could also be covered under the uh, assessment district maintenance contract or whatever they have for that. And those are the projects in the Skyline neighborhood. Question? Yeah. On the uh, one that the traffic committee said sign clutter, is it possible to like, we had the same problem at Jocelyn Canyon, people making U-turns right in the middle of the intersection. And we've so many people in our neighborhood have seen it. That's a matter of time before somebody gets broadsided and really injured, seriously. And we were told a million reasons bureaucratically you can't put a sign. There's a telephone pole right there. You put a sign, no U-turn. You say can't do it. How about is it possible to like stencil on the street, no U-turn? Instead of a sign, stencil something on the street. Is that feasible? Well, we can ask. I think the the traffic advisory committee was just assuming that people would follow the rules of the road, which you're supposed to know when you get your license. That's the yeah. problem. That's why you need a sign to tell people not to do it because they don't follow them. Yeah. And uh, 
it, it's very frustrating because we know somebody's going to get broadsided and really get taken out because as you because the intersection at where you turn right on Johnson Canyon Road off of Salinas Highway for eastbound it's more than a it's like a 120 degree turn it's and what happens is people come off of highway one they look for a place to make a u-turn to go back because they screwed up and they try to do the inner they try to make the turn right in the intersection it's only like about it's barely right at the street like enough to make a right turn headed eastbound but there's really no holding area there because it's gullies and uh we we tried to come up with everything and uh it's it's a safety hazard and we know it's a safety hazard but we've been told you can't fix it you can't put a sign up to i mean that i i see that thing sort of as the same type of situation up there but i was just thinking you know would it be possible to, to stencil something on the street I, no to use. be to be honest signs make no difference if people are going to do it that's we true. have an area going into the Alta Mesa Professional Center. There are three no right turn signs there. The intersection was redesigned to make it difficult. And every day, multiple people are doing right turns. In I'm, very, I'm very familiar with that, Rick. Thank you. <laughs> so I, it, it's, yeah, it, it's a feel good thing. But in general, they tend to not make a difference unless you have someone enforcing uh hey, dennis uh, your neighborhood you have questions or well we could start from the top or start from the bottom i don't care um right, that's up to you so the windermere canyon drainage design talking to tom and the other engineers uh they basically said the lower canyon doesn't necessarily need anything is this the upper canyon or the lower canyon because it says lower so i assume not the, lower, but I see log drops there. Yes, this is the lower, actually. Okay. So some have been installed on the lower canyon. Um, we were out there about a month ago. And this is a photo from the lower. But the, the my understanding was the design was talking about filling like many feet, multiple feet. About 30 feet. Yeah, yeah. 30 it, feet. Initially, the project was meant to stop silting the Federal Ocean. Yeah. Um, it's you know we effectively had nine hundred and seventy three thousand dollars across multiple fundings to get that built mm -hmm. and it's like not going to happen so if the city engineers are opining that there's no drainage runoff here then i'm not sure that we need the lower canyon design yes that, not that's true the, when we were there last month there was no evidence of recent erosion um, it looks the channel is pretty stable right now. It's it's steep in spots, but it's not sloughing off into the channel at this point. It's stable and vegetated pretty well. And then again, we've also been in historic drought too. True. I don't recall who the submitter of that project was, and a number of them in my uh, neighborhood said in the, in the book it says original application not found <laughs> yeah exactly which i think probably i was the submitter 2008 or something like that. yeah yeah mm -hmm. wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me if i was the submitter but we'll we'll check into that and figure out what we're doing with it what's the next one is the uh upper canyon the repair of the log drops that were installed yeah that i think we definitely need because it's either going to erode around it and destroy whatever was built there before or get repaired so i think we need that one and what's the next one um, i have a question quick question on those repairs what is the so those were designed way back then in the log drops and they've there's a whole bunch of them that are eroded around the side yes what's today's view of how those would be done differently if they were rebuilt i mean what was the I don't understand why those eroded around the side. I think the, the what happened, what I understand um, is that they were grouted, the rocks that was, so Gibeon baskets were used, they were installed, to kind of create a spillway to slow down the slope. It slows down the velocity of the flow. It spills over. Um, when you use Gibeon baskets, one of the, the beautiful things about it is, well, is that water can, 
seep through the rocks slowly. And in this case, my understanding is that the, it was um, grouted. So it became like, a, it, it's effectively a concrete wall. So when the water built up and the, the storm got larger, um, water wasn't able to kind of leak through the rocks of the Gabion basket. And it had to, it built up to the point where it ended up going around the outside of the, the rock, the rock wall. So um, we would have to look at how to most easily repair this without, again, it's, in a, it's, a, it's a really sensitive area. Um, there will be lots of approvals from the regional water board and um, maybe the Corps of Engineers and all kinds of people who would have to look at this um, to decide, to, to figure out the, the most, I guess, the least of, invasive way or you know just to try to minimize the amount of construction area that's going to happen on each one and only people who are immune to poison oak because air is tons yes. of it up there yeah. <laughs> yes okay this is the lower windermere canyon that we had a huge amount of funding for that isn't going to happen so I think I'm the submitter on that one. I'll probably take it out. Like the idea that this might number uh, SK6 might be paid for by uh, the sales tax stuff. So I'd like to see that happen. It actually goes from Pine Hill down in a kind of a V shape up to get to Mar Vista. So the bridge, it's a blight because of the spray painting on it and so on that's been variously repatched. One looks at this project and goes, $25,000, are you kidding me? Because of the right-of-way obstruction to be able to block the road off to be able to paint it, that's why it's so expensive. It's not that paint is $25,000. Correct. Because I think maybe the neighborhood should just go out and vandalize it one night and make it all one color. <laughs> <laughs> With, the right With the right paint. Maybe the HOA board will figure that one out. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, this has been an ongoing contest with parks in terms of maintaining these cul-de-sacs. Um, there is an assessment district in our neighborhood that supposedly is only for maintaining these cul-de-sacs because each of these cul-de-sacs has a water meter and a water spigot to be able to water and maintain them. I uncovered the one across from my house because it was buried under dirt and pine needles and have rocked it off so it could show up but be anxious to see if uh, public parks is going to do something with this project uh, traffic signs you know my take on this one and i'm sure it probably won't be a popular one but we have a ton of down trees in the neighborhood just put them next to the road then they can't turn around <laughs> and it gets rid of all those damn logs that are sitting in the forest and it still lets them die off and feed the birds and have the wonderful forest and it stops those u turns which way are those are they coming off of 68 making the turn mm -hmm. halfway down the street they they see that there's a side road there that goes off to it's off actually on the on the left there, a side road that goes off to community hospital. And if, if we ever had to get patients to community hospital because 68 was closed, break that chain, you go right up to the hospital. That they catch that, yeah, they catch that little turnout there. And you know, meanwhile, somebody's blasting off of 68. Somebody's gonna get hit. So I understand the need, but I think, you know strategically use the the refuge from previous down trees maybe you could answer it that way i was going to suggest that that this the project submitter put in a curb so i think the project submitter could say they're willing to change from a sign to some other thing and it's still a valid project because mm -hmm. a curb would be valid even if somebody didn't want to use a tree and a curb could be accomplished by a tree yes the, the, the problem, Dennis, with the trees is they are not allowed because that they become a road hazard. So we had 
a project on Iris Canyon to deal with parking and our preferred one was to use trip boulders or things of that nature. And we're told we couldn't. And ironically, if that was no longer a project because all of a sudden big logs appeared because that's just where they stored them and it solved the problem. So yeah, it will be a challenge to get traffic to agree to it. You just need to have them appear one day. That's, can you guess where I got the idea? <laughs> I can imagine <laughs> the Irish Canyon thing. It works real well, but they just have to appear there. They can't be part of a project or poor traffic will not like it because someone might get drunk and run into it and sue the city. Uh, repainting the signs again. I, the uh, the assessment district I don't believe is for that, but you know, let's let's figure out what we could do on that one. And that's it. Okay. Any member of the committee wish to ask questions or speak to any of the skyline projects? Jamie, you have your hand up. Yeah. Is there's no problem with access for the um, SK? For the repair of the log drops, I know in the past they had problems wanting to get in. So even though we could fund the project, there would be more money in separate projects to build the roadway down to have access. In the lower canyon, there would have to be construction of a temporary roadway. Uh, <coughs> concern is eating piparia and um, falcons and that kind of birds of prey uh, and all of those things and permitting, et cetera, to get that. The upper Windermere Canyon log drops are visible from the road, but you're not going to be able to get equipment going up the canyon base or the because of the log drops and that kind of stuff. So you're going to have to access that. Um, and it's those are the things that make it difficult to do. You know, it's it's somewhat like painting the the parapets on the roadway there. You gotta block off the traffic, which costs more money than doing the painting. Uh, any other members of the committee that have questions? questions? Okay, uh, I am not seeing any hands raised from online attendees. Is there anyone in the council chambers who wishes to speak to Skyline, any of the Skyline project? None. Okay, then we'll move on to Villa Domani. Villa Del Monte has 12 projects proposed um, this cycle. Three of them um, have been completed. The Montecito Park Safety Improvements Prony Park Design Study was completed and the street name sign replacement has been done. Um, the first project is for a radar speed sign. Um, this was originally proposed in 2007. Uh, we're just assuming it will be about $45,000 to install two radar speed signs. This one, I believe, was on Casanova Avenue, or, or it would be to the, the exact location to be determined. Uh, the second project would be for the traffic calming to construct one of the projects within the traffic calming plan. Uh, it was originally proposed in 2007, and we figured the current estimate for this would be three, about $320,000. The photo is at um, Palo Verde. We're looking up at um, Encina and Garden. Um, that on the far right behind the stop sign is uh, Ferranti Park. The third project is the traffic calming plan phase two at Casa Verde and Encina, a curb extension. Um, and this was originally proposed in 2007. Uh, we estimate it to be about $160,000 currently. Um, this one uh, is just the work has been done on Casa Verde recently. Um, and about a, uh, two years ago, I think now with the uh, the intersection at Helvick and Portola as well. Um, this area has been striped and uh, I recall from speaking with uh, Jeff Krebs in the past that there was an issue with the property owner at this parcel where the curb um, extension would come from, uh, who was not in favor of allowing the project to proceed, which is why it, it didn't, I think, before. 
Um, the eighth project is for the hardscape murals under the Highway 1 bridge on Casa Verde Way. Um, it was originally approved in 2017. We estimate it'll be about $365,000. This would be to install some mosaic um, artwork underneath the bridge and, and do some other improvements as well. Uh, project number 10 is Ramona Avenue Highway Screening. In the photo on the right, you could see some of the trees. This was from 2015, this photo from Google Street View. Um, several of those trees have died and been removed since. So the, um, the project is to replant some of the trees that are there to provide more screening to the highway at this location. And then um, project number 11 is at Ferrani Park, the play area upgrade and enlargement. Um, there was a um, plan for Ferranti Park that was approved probably four to five years ago, maybe not quite that long, but there is a plan that's developed. You can see uh, a portion of it on the right-hand side. The full scope of the project was to make the street one way coming in from the, the left now and then to expand the, um, the play area and then provide parking all the way, like diagonal parking along the, the side. This project, um, there's a photo there, would occur in this area. Uh, we estimate about $250,000 just to do this portion of the overall project that was in the, the park study. And then project number 12 is for a, a neighborhood sign at Casa Verde and um, Helvick. Um, this was proposed before the intersection was reworked a couple of years ago. The photo in the middle is how it looks today. So the installation of the, the neighborhood sign, that the, the pedestal sign that they're looking for would may need to be relocated. We'd have to find a, a better place for it than that. Uh, estimate about $75,000 for that project. Uh, project number 13 is sidewalk repairs around Ferranti Park. Again, this is one that um, is most likely eligible for funding under Measure P or S because it's a public the park and it's alongside the street. So that should be eligible for funding from Measure P and S. Project number 14 is for the Casa Verde Way, the bike infrastructure. The nominated project is asking for, I believe it was a class two um, bike lanes to be painted along Casa Verde between Del Monte and Fremont, North Fremont. Um, this would involve uh, eliminating parking along that way. So um, that's a sensitive issue in the neighborhood. Um, we're assuming that that will not occur. So the $30,000 that we have um, proposed for a cost here is just for striping, the, they call them sharrows, but on the lower right here in the photo, you can see it's a picture of a bicycle with the, the two double, looks like corporal stripes, right? Um, that's the sharrows, which means that the bicyclists have full right to be in the center of the lane and you have to share the lane with cyclists if you're a motorist. Um, this is a project, that's the proposal that was um, included in the, the multimodal plan, the Move Monterey plan, which is um, in the upper right. And it was um, intended to be as is uh, to be set up for, they call it class three bike lane. And those are the projects for Villa Del Monte. Duane, do you want to speak or ask questions on any of these? Well, um, as far as the uh, project number one, the radar sign, <clears throat> again, this is one of those projects where the original isn't available. So it's, it's a guess where the sign was wanted. I, I don't know. Uh, regrettably, when Harry passed away, uh, the family cleaned out his personal file, so I, I inherited nothing. So whatever there is is in the city records. That's it. So 
I'm not sure if that's unless somebody comes up with an idea of where to put it. Um, the traffic calming phases one and two. Uh, I'm not sure how much was accomplished on uh, uh, project number three with the recent rehab of the area near the school. I think it was partially done, wasn't it? I remember that it was striped, but I also remember Jeff Krebs saying that the, the property owner did not want the curb bulbed out, extended out. He wanted right. his driveways to be just as they are today, which is why even in the photo, it shows us a, a striped area. Mm -hmm. So that traffic, we're trying to direct traffic um, toward the street as they go southbound, like up the hill toward the freeway um, without actually building a, a concrete curb and an island over there. Okay. Um, project eight and I'll say uh, 12, I believe the submitter, uh, our neighborhood president is listening and will want to speak on those. So I'll let her, uh, the tree planting, I think they were, were we gonna try and find out if the trees that were removed were on Caltrans or on city property? Uh, project 10, the, the oh. screening. Yes, the big trees that you can see in the photo here are on Caltrans. And uh, my understanding is that parks did go out and plant several, like one or two, maybe smaller ones. And um, oh, they're looking for additional trees to kind of fill up. They're, they're much smaller than, so do we, than what was there. Do we call this completed or in process? Or? No, I think they're looking for additional trees to be planted to make it uh, denser. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would assume this is a valid project. All right. Yeah. Okay. And uh, the Franny Park upgrades, now it's still part of the uh, request. We'll, we'll see what happens. I know the, the issues with one weighing, but uh, I think that project is still desired by the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So we'll let that run and see how it goes. And uh, sidewalk repairs, I guess that's going to be switched over to the, all right. And uh, the, I guess 14 is kind of up in the air. It's gonna be covered by the multimodal. It's right now it's in the multimodal plan as a class three um bike lane so the only thing that would we would do to that would be to add the the striping those sharrows as they're called um just so that people when they're driving understand that there will be bicycles in the, the traveled portion of the street but there's no plan to eliminate parking from that area which is what it would take to to make it a dedicated cycling lane You'd have to put it down where the cars park now. And um, I, I definitely wouldn't try and remove any parking at all uh, with the row that happened when that hotel got approved. That that was enough, thank you. Uh, and it's going to be it's going to be rough once that thing goes. But uh, that's all I. Tom, uh, on the original submitter specified class two, correct? I'm going to look it up. That's what I recall. Um, because if they, they specified class two, before we go changing the project to be a class three, you might want to check with them. Got it. We'll, we'll check on that. I don't see it popping out at me right yeah, now. I just, just so that, you know, they don't all of a sudden if something gets done, then Oh, your project was done and no it didn't <laughs> uh doesn't say Dwayne. original project doesn't say okay Dwayne, uh, any more comments or questions nope that's okay yeah. i'll do richard and then i think i see jamie with a hand up but richard had his up first so 
Okay, I, I want to speak to Project 14. They shared bikeway. I have a question for Tom on the traffic committee. There's a state law that says that a car passing a bike rider has to have three foot of clearance. So basically in a shared bikeway, there's no room at Casa Verde to have a bike on the side of you and be three feet away without crossing the center line. So basically a shared bike lane is a death trap. One eye blink and the bike rider's down. So uh, I'd like to get a clarification on the state law on the proximity of cars to bike riders. We'll get that for you, Richard. The, uh, the intent of the shadows is that the cyclists would be riding right smack down the middle of the the aisle so that there's it's actually a shared driving lane so like on the photo <laughs> on the screen it, you'd be driving all <laughs> of the road so that you wouldn't have to pass you'd have to wait until the cycle made it through in practicality the car wants to get around the bike rider who is slower than the car and it's always a mess yes yeah and, and three feet, you are correct, that three feet is the distance that you're required to be um, the separating distance between a vehicle and a cyclist. Okay. Anything else, Richard? No, that's it. Hey, Jamie. Quick, uh, on project number 11, the park upgrades, I had heard from somebody in the neighborhood that that was a really bad idea. And so the, re, the it brings two thoughts to mind. Um, and the first one is this seems to be a traffic engineering conversation, a, a pretty big one. So is this in the traffic calming plan? And then the second thing is what neighbors have to sign off on something like this. I mean, how do you measure the 300 feet of impact? Because you're not just taking one parking spot, you're taking everybody's, making a change for everybody, which is why I point back to, I guess if it's in the traffic plan, you don't need the sign off of neighbors, but I wanna be sure we are real clear on that. They had gotten the, uh, originally the neighbors all along that street to uh, agree to it. Yeah. So whether uh, you know it's it's going to fly or not, I don't know. But they, I'll, they I'll support that. I was on the van tour when we talked to all the neighbors. Mm -hmm. They were all in favor of it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that time, Kurt. Kurt, you have your um, hand up. Uh, yeah, on the same project. I I remember. F. Cribs mentioning that the fire department had a big issue with making that a one way uh, by the park. So you might want to check with them also. Tom, aren't they part of the traffic committee? Yes. And yeah. the traffic committee reviewed this? Yes, they did. Okay. Uh, Richard, do you still have your hand up or you just haven't put it down? And Kurt, I still see a hand up. Do you have another question? Okay, no, no, Kurt. And Richard, do you still want to? All right. Uh, Dennis. So on that thing about the bicycles, yes, the state law is three feet away. And yes, you're allowed to cross double yellow lines to maintain that as long as you can do it safely. So double yellow lines are not a restriction when you have a share of, uh, but you got to do a safe pass by the bicycle. Thank you. Okay. All and right. One more thing to add on that. Uh, ahead, so we, talked, we talked about that being in the move Monterey multimodal plan. It is just a concept and it's not funded in any way. So this is what well, this would be a, uh, an opportunity for NCIP to fund uh, any work at that project. Okay. All right. Uh, we have a member of the public, uh, Michaela Fossum. Go ahead. And Alyssa, I don't know if you need to unmute or anything. 
I'm seeing she's muted. Okay, there you go. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, hi. I'm the president of Villa Del Monte Neighborhood Association and the submitter of this project. Um, and I know this is just a cursory review tonight, um, but I do want to remind all the committee members who were there when this was approved. Um, and for some reason, the bike infrastructure is up and I'm talking about a, yeah, that's, that's it, the Casa Verde Highway 1 hardscape murals. Um, and for anyone who's new to the committee, I just wanna um, point out, this isn't just about the mosaic hardscape murals. This is about hardscaping a weed ridden eyesore with heavy traffic off of Highway 1 coming into our neighborhood and going to Del Monte Beach. Anyone who's gonna to go to a fairground event like the Jazz Festival passes through here. I mean, you know, the chances are they're gonna pass through there. And it's a real eyesore, it has been for a long time. It, I pass through there at least twice a day. Um, and it needs to be hardscaped to control the weeds. Um, and I just had this vision that on those two sloped walls, if you can see it, um, on the picture there of the underpass, yeah. It would be wonderful to have a public art project there, um, like on one side to have the old Del Monte train chugging along till the old Del Monte hotel. And on the other side, perhaps a, a scene of the Monterey Bay. Um, we put a lot of work into this. I talked to Caltrans many times about this and they're all for it. They have a public art transportation department. Um, Jamie Fields, what, I think she's still on the board of Bayview and she was all for it. Um, the Bayview School has a mosaic project for their, I believe sixth graders. And they helped put little square mosaics on Montecito Park. Um, so this would be a community effort where we would involve the community in actually placing the mosaics and the tiles. Um, obviously, we'd have to put a bit out call to artists, although I do have an artist, these are examples of her work, who has worked really hard on um, proposing this and talking to everybody. So, um, and the other half of that is to have tower signs at the freeway exits. Um, like you saw on project uh, 12. And I also submitted the project 12 um, for, yeah, the tower sign. Okay, so all of these ideas come from the Villa Del Monte revitalization plan that was approved, I believe in 2015. It specifically has tower signs like this. It also specifically promotes public art, including mosaics. Um, the whole plan is to revitalize and beautify this neighborhood that has historically uh, been overlooked a lot. We feel like we're the hood of Monterey. So, um, and in this picture, in the center picture, this is the project you did last year, I believe, to improve that intersection for safety of school children and pedestrians. So I don't know if it's possible, Tom, but I envisioned this tower going in the middle of there. And that's all I have for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other member of the public or in the audience to speak to this? Okay, uh, seeing none, we will move on to Community-wide. Uh, before we dive into community-wide, does anyone uh, feel we need to do a break or should we dive straight in? Okay, I don't hear an overwhelming rush for a break, so we'll go straight into city community-wide. Um, so there are um, 73 nominated projects. So <laughs> hopefully we will take a break before that. <laughs> Um, and they didn't even fit on one page in a readable format. So I think we have four different or maybe five or maybe six. Um, but we've got the first 12 on this page. As you can see, some of the projects that are on the list um, were completed before they were defunded by city council. Um, so 
that we're, we won't even be discussing them this evening. Um, and we'll go through the, the next dozen. And there are two um, projects, number 26 and 27. One has been withdrawn and the other is completed, the theme, the bike racks. Um, project number 44 has also been completed with project 49. Uh, pedestrian access study was completed in um, project number 60. The basketball courts repairs were completed, um, but there's, I believe, another project. And uh, project number 65, the fire station, the soundproofing is a completed project as well. So um, Rick, just interrupt me when, when it's time. Project number one, um, this is on Holman Highway. Um, for a gate at the Presidio, it's for emergency access. This, in everyone we've spoken with on this project, no one's in support of it. So um, we haven't bothered to put a, a cost to it. Um, project number two, Historic Monterey Master Plan for Art, um, is supported by the Museum and Cultural Arts Commission. Um, this would be to install, mm, just to develop a master plan for installing art throughout the city. Um, project number five is public art security plan. This would be to install um, security systems on the public art. Um, there are still issues that need to be resolved with um, the city's, the city currently has no policy for, um, installing cameras in public spaces. So that is a big hurdle that, that has to be addressed before we can implement um, that project. Here's another one of those um, underground utility ones. This is for a fiber optic feasibility study. Um, this was proposed in 2018. And I think one of the um, projects is, uh, well, currently AT&T has a number of encroachment permits throughout the city and they are installing fiber optic um, cable throughout town. So it, we may have lost, missed our window on this one. I think this project was uh, actually withdrawn by the submitter. Okay. I mentioned that last time, but I think that that was uh, with the AT&T. The idea was that the city install fiber and then rent it to the various companies and have control over it. And I think with AT&T putting in fiber, the boat's been missed. And uh, so uh, Ray, who submitted the project has actually withdrawn that. Okay. Thanks, Hans. Project okay. number nine. On CW5, oh. I got 60K. Yes. Okay. Still around. Okay. Um, project number nine is the community wide restroom study. And this would be a project to look at the locations. We have a number of restroom projects that have been proposed and approved and funded in the past, um, but this would be taking one step back and looking for locations where they're needed and to determine how many stalls would be used in each um, of the locations. Project number 10, here's the pilot project um, to install conduit on a street repair project. Um, this is just looking for opportunity to get some conduit in the ground. Project number 11 is for bike repair stations along the rec trail. And this one is the one that um, I believe the structures were in, in the nomination form The they were funded by TAMC on this project. Project number 12 is um, also on the rec trail. It's a water bottle refill station. And several people have made a point that they like the ones on the right-hand side of the screen here that have the dog bowl at the bottom. Project number 13 is accessible beach mats. This was proposed in 2019 and funded. Uh, we estimate about $50,000 for this. Um, Parks and Rec looked at this and the, the, everyone is in favor of this project. However, um, it's going to take maintenance and someone's going to actually have to be hired or 
dedicated to to rolling those out and taking them back and you know dusting them off and things so it will be a a maintenance issue for parks and rec um and that was a comment we got from the park staff project number 14 is for a preliminary engineers report um, to do the underground utility um this was submitted in 2020 and it was not acted on and we're estimating about a hundred thousand dollars to do a report on the left hand side of this page is a, a similar report from the city of newport beach that they had done for a, a neighborhood down there project number 15 is for construction and design of a six court pickleball complex we located um, the this to be the best spot in the city that we found was out at Ryan Ranch, adjacent to the Stinging Jellies Disc Golf Course up there. Project number 16 is for a community-wide tree inventory. This was also submitted in 2020 by the forester. At the time, uh, he asked for $150,000 to begin inventorying the trees throughout the city. There, some of this work has been done apparently, or may have been done. There's a um, some GIS layers that are available, so we would have to look at what we have and then how much more is needed, and really kind of dive in to see how much it would take if we're to if we're going to inventory every tree within the public owned properties of the city. It would probably be more than one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, I would think. Um, project number 17 is for green belt fuel reduction, submitted in 2020 also by the Forester um, for $300,000 to be used, $300,000 to be used this year throughout the city. Project number 18 uh, was submitted in 2022, I think, um, for solar car charging stations. Um, these are they call them portable, but they kind of need a crane to be installed there. On the photo on the right, you can see how the, the cars are underneath, but the it looks like the stalls are painted gray, but that's actually like a big steel plate that counterbalances the weight on the top. Uh, we estimated, we did a little bit of research and found that they cost about 60 to $70,000 each. So by the time we install them, and we're assuming they're going to be about $95,000, but that's an estimate. One of the questions we had from someone was just whether this was an actual capital improvement project since they're mobile. Project number 19 is El Dorado Street. This is for a driveway reconstruction project. There are five driveways with a steep apron um, from the street, which has been overlaid before to their driveways. You can see in the, the photo there, it's just, it's uh, maybe a couple of feet wide. So they would like to bring those up to the current standard and flatten them out. So they're not bottoming out um, every time. This up on the top right there, this was one of the projects that was, uh, we had formally, from here on forth, we'd taken projects out of the neighborhoods what you recall when we first prepared the book and submitted all the projects, every project was in a neighborhood and the resounding, like every time I met with anyone on going through the project, you're like, just call them citywide again. So we're, we're calling oh. them community wide. Um, but, but this, this one also was never in Alta Mesa to begin with. So. That's correct. So this one is the first of many um, that was formally listed in, I have it twice, I noticed, um, from Alta Mesa, incorrectly there. It's between downtown and Monterey Vista. It goes down the center line of the street. Project number 20 is uh, Fremont Street, uh, Villa Morada, a traffic signal, and the Traffic Advisory Committee recommended a scope to conduct a warrant study to determine whether a signal is actually needed at this location. Um, their concern was just that this may result in increased rear end collisions at this location on Fremont Street. Project number 21 is for North Fremont. 
street uh, beautification project. The description asked for some landscaping around the sign, which um, I'm assuming is the, the one you see in the upper right corner, the welcome to Monterey, the city sign, but they also asked for LED lighting in the trees and just uh, a bunch of different um, things along the length of North Fremont Street. Is this beautification for the for the bike trail? Yes. The bike lane to nowhere, yeah. Project number 22 is um, the old Salinas Highway. There's a, a pedestrian sign and lighting. The last piece of this that needs to be completed is to get the service drop um, for the street light that's been installed there. And um, we estimate $20,000 for that one. This one had, there was a lot of signatures that came with the application on this one from the neighbors. Project number 23, Jocelyn Canyon Road, uh, the re radar speed signs. It's to be about $45,000 for two radar speed signs, one in each direction. Um, the traffic advisory committee recommends revising the scope to just include archeological reporting and monitoring, which will be required in that part of town. Who, who said this? The Traffic Advisory Committee. And who are they? It's um, traffic, um, planning. We had three meetings on this. Yes, planning. This it would be something that would have to happen during the project. Planning, police, fire, parking, um, and traffic. So all those departments. I guess I don't get what the traffic advisory e. committee who doesn't even familiar with this area is going to tell us. Tom, it, the reality is you dig almost anywhere in the city of Monterey because when the general plan was done, they designated almost the entire city as an archae archaeologically sensitive. So you want to install a street sign in a lot of areas. You have to have an archaeological report and monitor not specific to this project. And I'll just throw out too that the traffic advisory committee, they make recommendations. They're not saying that we have to not, they, they I mean, I would like have been glad to go to the traffic advisory committee and explain to them the need for this. Mm -hmm. I, but they I like know about the meeting. Okay. They're in favor of the project. That was a comment that came up during, it was probably from planning who's concerned about the archeology. span So as long as everyone knows that that's gonna be a component of this project, that's the, all the location is key to get people to slow, slow down. down. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you. Yeah. And, and Tom, I, I, let me just make one comment right now. I was gonna wait until later, but just so everyone understands, we have always treated a yay or nay from the traffic committee as a, uh, it can kill a project. Uh, one thing that we need to clarify is they are an advisory committee. They are not a Brown Act committee. So therefore, they are simply making recommendations, which we could follow or choose not to. Now, we might want to have a discussion later on of the importance of what they're saying, I think is very important, but it's not a formal a denial of a thing if they do not agree with it, because they are not legally a, a that type of a committee. That's correct. And it, again, they're, they're not saying that they don't like the project. They're just saying this is an issue that will have to be addressed. Project number 24 is, um, it, it was called that as at Del Monte Beach, but I believe Jamie said, this isn't Del Monte Beach. So it, it's further down toward Monterey Beach Park. Um, it's fence and sign repair. Um, it was submitted in 2020 and never acted upon. Uh, we looked at the length of the, the fencing that needs work um, and came up with a cost of about $105,000. Um, project number 25 is at Lake Alastero. It's the Great Blue Heron structure. The structure is apparently sinking, though work has been done. We, I learned an hour ago, well, two hours ago now, um, that they had done some work to, to raise that, but it tends to sink. 
It was proposed in 2017. It was underfunded at the time. Uh, we're estimating it would be about $85,000 to kind of get that on a, a footing that will stay and not sink. Project number 27 is for the Library Learning Lab. Proposed in 2017, we have a note from the, the librarian who said that the library board is no longer interested in pursuing this project. Project number 28 on Pacific Street at the end of the library driveway for a street light, a new street light. Uh, the library supports this project. Um, again, for a street light, we're just assuming they're all at $20,000. We'll refine that at a later point. Project number 29 is for uh, some Portland loos to be installed throughout the downtown area. And again, what we're um, suggesting is that the restroom study be completed to see where in town restrooms are really needed and then how many um, stalls should be installed at each location prior to actually installing them all over the place. Project number 30 is a waterfront wayfinding signs. This would be the way the application, the nomination um, form was submitted, made it sound like a mall sign um, for the businesses on Fisherman's Wharf in the waterfront area. We had about $30,000 allocated to that one. Project number 31 is at Dennis the Menace Park for expression swings. Um, this is uh, supported by the Parks and Rec staff and commission. Um, these are the swings that face each other. It's going to cost about $8,000 to put them in. We did speak at the last meeting. The submitter made a comment, and we discussed the day afterward about combining the projects. There's another one for um, up in Monterey Vista at Via Paraiso Park and uh, decided to, the submitter decided to leave them separate. So we have two. Um, project number 32 is for the sports center, the pool modernization submitted in 2020. And we've got uh, $400,000 allocated to this for the repairs over there. Project number 33 is at Elastero Park. We have bike and pedestrian path design. This is to design a multi-purpose, multi-use trail that goes around the entire park. So it would be 10 feet wide. Um, a lot of the area now is, um, as you see in the photos, it's uh, decomposed granite. So it would be to make it something more permanent. Um, at, and it would go around the park and we're figuring for the design of that $125,000. Project number 34 is Fremont Street at Monris Avenue. It's, there's an uncontrolled crosswalk um, right around the corner as you're coming in from the freeway on Fremont Street. This would be to install the rapid um, flashing beacons at this location to protect pedestrians as you're coming around the corner. Project number 35 is at Fremont Streets to repair the de or to install, repair, widen, decompose granite walkway along Fremont Street um, by the cemeteries on the north end. That's already done, pretty much. A piece of it has been done by the, the property owner there, but the they're talking about the, the project description was for the whole length of it. We've got the last little bit. Um, so there's still a, a lot of the work that needs to be completed there. Project number 36 is also at Elastero Park. It's the picnic area of the shade structure. It was proposed in 2020, but never acted upon. And uh, just a rough estimate on installing something over the, the barbecue area here uh, would be about $65,000. Um, Jack's Park infield turf um, is also one that's proposed in 2020. Um, figure about $750,000 for this one. And again, at Ellis Darrow Park Center, this is a play equipment upgrade. 
which would be about $65,000. Get that done. Uh, project number 39, this also is at Ellis Tower Park. This is the par course um, along the lake. This is on the west side there. Um, about $65,000 to upgrade that. Solicitor Ballpark, the field lighting um, for about $300,000, we can install LED lights instead of the ones that are there now, which are expensive to operate. Project number 41 is the old capital site, fuel reduction and cleanup. This was the property that the city acquired right as we were learning about COVID. Um, two years ago, and um, this was submitted back then to do some fuel reduction throughout the property and some cleanup as well. Um, it's still on the books, and we have it down for $250,000. And then Project 42, same site, uh, would be to develop a master plan for using uh, the old capital site. Uh, we are assuming that we can get it done for $90,000. Project number 43 is Pacific Street Corridor. There's a adaptive traffic signal system and it would be about $100,000 to install the adaptive traffic lights. So the signals are timed and they account for the traffic that's in the area before the, the changes occur, before the lights change. Project number 45 is the Cannery Row Workers Shacks. Um, we have $140,000 we estimate to restore them. There's the three shacks there on Bruce Aris Way. This is a photo from the rec trail, looking at them in front of the aquarium. And then also there's a, a project number 46 is for signage to the restrooms that are located along the rec trail. Project number 47 is for restoration and signage at the Fish Hopper, which is at Shoreline Park. This is adjacent to the rec trail by the lighthouse curve there. And it's a historic structure that uh, parks and, or the Museums and Cultural Arts Committee would like to preserve. Project number 48 is for uh, reconstructing the DG, the decomposed granite along the rec trail, again, near lighthouse curve, but not quite there. Um, we have a, a designs were prepared for a portion of this work and um, to install them would be about $245,000. Project number 50 is for a study of the rec trail between Fisherman's Wharf and Coast Guard Pier. We have $75,000 allocated toward that. Uh, Traffic Advisory Committee recommends advising the scope to include extensive public outreach and follow up with Parks and Rec Commission. The uh, implications of e-bikes should be considered in the study. Project number 51 is for the rec trail lane delineation. Uh, Fisherman's Wharf to Monterey Bay Aquarium. Uh, we did not put a price on this one. We, the Traffic Advisory Committee recommended doing the study before funding implementation of a project. Um, they also did not support this one. Um, they're, from what I understand, about 50% of Monterey is in favor of separating walking and biking lanes and the other 50% is opposed to it. So it's a it's very sensitive. Um, there will be a lot of public outreach required for that one. Project number 52 is also on the rec trail. It's for an automated pedestrian and bike counter. Um, those posts that are in the photos are actually, they, they count the number of people, pedestrians and bikes that go by. Uh, we can use the data for this when we apply for grants for funding projects for the rec trail. Uh, the traffic advisory committee committee recommended using a product that collects speed data in addition to just the counting how many uh, pedestrians and bikes go by. Project number 53 is at Schultze Park. 
of the foam and drake area they're looking to redesign and renovate um, that big open area at the corner of foam and drake we had uh, $65,000 for the design and up to $300,000 to do a portion or maybe all of the work, depending on what comes up with the design. Project number 54 is a Lighthouse Avenue pedestrian improvement study. We had $80,000 um, toward this allocated toward this project. This project will take a lot of time to do the pedestrian studies and uh, watching the turning movements of vehicles along there. So it'll be, it will just be a time intensive, manpower intensive project. Um, and also the traffic advisory just wanted to express that this will be a considerable operational change along Lighthouse Avenue um, if vehicles won't be able to turn right on red, I think was the intent of this. Project number 55 was the Monterey Police and Fire Honor Garden. Um, it was originally approved in 2017. We're figuring that it will cost about $130,000. This project was um, brought to the Museum and Cultural Arts Commission. They did not like they supported the project, but not the artwork that was proposed there. So they wouldn't accept the actual sculpture that is proposed to be installed there, but they were not opposed to the project. Project number 56 is at the Rodriguez Osio Adobe. It's a path of history mural that they're looking for, basically a sign um, that shows historical sites through the city of Monterey that we allocated $15,000 toward. Project number 57 is the Colton at Colton Hall. It's the Monterey Walk of History Milestones. It's a really poor picture. I was trying to do this quickly. And there are um, the brass plaques in the brick sidewalk in front of the jail on the right photo up in the up in the right. They've asked for uh, five more plaques to be installed on the the far end of the from the photo, just to continue the it's a timeline. Um, project number fifty eight is Ryan Ranch RV storage lot for security. We figured it would be fifty thousand dollars, and again, this is another project where the city does not have a policy for installing cameras in public spaces, um, but this would be just for securing the, the RVs that are parked up at Ryan Ranch. Project number 59 is Highway 1 bike path upgrade. There is a bike path on the left. I didn't realize this until I saw this application. Um, adjacent to Highway 1 between uh, Holman Highway and Viejo Road. So this would be to repair the asphalt that's over there. It's kind of lumpy and um, needs upgrading. We estimate $225,000. Project number 61 is at Veterans Park. There's a bike path, a segment four, uh, to construct a bike path from Veterans Drive, I guess that is up to the park. So it'd be kind of through that um, flat area in there, adjacent to the, the sidewalk path that goes off to the right. Project number 62 is for improvements to the basketball court at Veterans Park. We had $64,000 allocated to this. Um, what they're looking for is to have a full half court um, field or court, uh, full half court right now, it's smaller than a normal size court. So just be to enlarge that. And I think there were bollards involved as well. Uh, project number 63 is for the bocce court. It's to resurface the existing bocce court there. We figured about $17,000. There was a question about what the surface that was requested is. So we'll do a little research on that if it's a priority project for the committee. Project number 64 is to look at the Via del Rey and Veterans Park intersection. 
Um, it's big, it's wide. You can see in the bottom, it, it's people like to travel quickly through there. So this would just be to look at the intersection and come up with a redesign prior to allocating any construction funding toward the project. Project number 66 is for lake edge improvements along El Estero Lake. Um, this is a project, this, I think it said phase five or something. So this, there have been a lot of different phases. There have been different locations through here. Um, it was originally proposed in 2012. And this is another one where the environmental regulations at the moment would not allow us to do the types of projects that we had done in the past. Uh, we had installed, my understanding is we installed gabion baskets along to protect the, the lake edge, but that would be a no, it would be difficult to approve a project like that at this point. Uh, project number 67 on Ramona Avenue, there's a stormwater runoff infiltration. There was a proposal and a design that, that was submitted to uh, install infiltration systems along Ramona Avenue and uh, the neighborhood representative Richard wanted to withdraw this project so we did not put a price on it. Project number 68 is at Veterans Park. It's the day use area. There's erosion control. This was be kind of similar to a log drop type of situation. But again, environmental permitting, there will be issues that need to be resolved because it's a water course. It's a sensitive, potentially sensitive habitat through there. Project number 69 is at Monterey Bay Park. It's the restrooms. Again, we're suggesting that we complete the restroom study, which is project number community-wide number nine, <laughs> prior to awarding construction funding for, the, for this project. Project number 70 is Monterey Bay Park Shower Station. When I originally read this, I thought it was just going to be a shower head coming out of the wall of the restroom, but it's actually, the photos on the right are the one that they referenced at um, San Carlos Beach. And it's more of like a, a post that the divers and swimmers can use just to rinse off before they go back to their cars or wherever they go, hotel rooms. Project number 71 is the Monroe Soledad freeway entrance signage. Uh, we talked about this at the last meeting, I believe, and the traffic advisory committee was just concerned about sign clutter at this intersection. I think the proposal is to install just a sign that indicates northbound Highway 1, turn left here, um, southbound, continue straight, and this would be on, on Munras Avenue. Project number 72 is the Franklin Street Corridor. It's the adaptive traffic signal system. Um, again, it's $100,000 to, to coordinate the timing of the traffic lights through the Franklin Street Corridor through downtown. And project number 73 is the Monterey Peninsula. It's a regional fire defense plan. The plan is to um, be developed with the Pebble Beach and City of Carmel and the County of Monterey, and to have a like a I call it I would call it a master plan, but just to have a plan that we could use and submit um, to request funding from different agencies um, to have a plan in place is is helpful when requesting grant funding. Yes. On that uh, CWPP, the uh, Community Wildlife or Wildfire uh, Planning uh, Program. Yes. That's actually been funded, uh, but the chief would really enjoy a uh, uh, upper monitor from this committee that we support that so that they can get done. Uh, the intent there was something that we started from the Skyline Forest neighborhood to avoid uh, or reduce the fuels that would uh, stop right after Carmel has a fire. And of course it would stop when Pebble Beach has a fire when it gets into Skyline Forest and gets into Monterey. Mm -hmm. So we've been meeting with the chief and uh, Caltrans and Cal Fire and the local districts to uh, work together on mitigating the fuels up there. And you probably have seen along the uh, 
17 mile drive, the uh, goats today uh, working out there, cleaning up some of those things, including the poison oak uh, to keep those fuels down and the masticator that went through there about 18 months ago that kind of cleaned that area up as part of all of that activity that's going on regionally. This would be a fire defense plan that would be, this is a study which gives you a document that you can use to go ask for cow fire funds for federal for things, et cetera. Thank you, Dennis. So at some point, if we could send some kind of letter from the committee saying, yes, we all support this, it'd be great. So it doesn't actually need funding. I could leave it on there, but the chief actually was able to get funding in the mid budget, mid year budget cycle. Okay, so it Okay, well then, then it might not make sense to continue as a project, but we just need to make sure we agendize formal ta formally taking a, a position. I think that'd be great. That's the 73 projects and community-wide. Just a little history on the first one that, of course, we know is not going to happen. We originally started trying to get some relief from traffic in our neighborhood and over in New Monterey to sort of channel it out, you know, spread the wealth around. And then, of course, 9-11 happened and that shut down the Presidio. So we know there's no chance of that happening. I mean, there's a perfect place for it to exit where they first started to build a road out. I can't remember what. <laughs> what drive but it's close to the pebble beach area and then you know that was wishful thinking until 9 11. <laughs> were there any other questions on the any of the projects community-wide Actually, Tom, on CW28, Yes, I'm the submitter on that. And it's not actually to put the light by the library driveway. It's to put the light down by the city parking lot across the, uh, across the bridge there. There's already a, a pole there. There's an electric pole there. So it's just a matter of putting the light on the pole. Got it. Thank you, Kirk. And that's the one in, well, I'll talk to you, but the one that's in front of the city parking lot there, it's kind of to the, when you look at the front of the library building off to the right a little bit. Correct, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I just realized I was calling on curtain. I was, I was muted, so sorry about that, everyone. Richard, and then I see any, and then Jamie. Yes, uh, I have a question for Tom about the rec trail projects. Uh, over the years, we have discussed these projects multiple times. Uh, as the Parks and Rec Commission, they, they made a decision a couple of years ago, uh, and I hate to start the public process all over again when the final decision was made. So Tom, did they tell you anything about these studies? No, and um, they did say that one of the, someone from the commission will be attending the the public comment meetings here. But I can give them a heads up that that will be a question for them. Yes, because if there's already been a decision, then it's not a valid project, and and I just hate to redo over and over. I know it's gone before the council too, so I know there's a lot of new staff. But if we could find out if uh, the final decision was made previously or not. Thank you. Other than that, the citywide is an extremely long list. Uh, uh, I'm going to pass on further comments till I can go over it again. Thank you. Okay. Jamie? Cool. I have five questions. Um, on Project Citywide 13, the beach access mats, I'm wondering if that's something that the, the public can roll out when it's needed. 
I, I don't know. So it'd, it'd be left rolled up. And uh, on project CW14, um, on the undergrounding study, wait, wait. We, had, we had talked about doing a city, citywide study of undergrounding in the past so that when each neighborhood wanted to do it, we wouldn't have to do it again. So did that not get done? Or is this a submitter not aware that we already have a study? That was a number of years ago, but I think it was about feasibility and, and getting the specifications out. So I don't know. Next question. That was CW14, I think. Um, then a couple on the last uh, bits. On CW53, um, Oh. Jamie, I can ask about CW14. Oh, yeah. Um, that was put together by two people, one from Old Town and one from Monterey Vista. And the idea was um, things haven't been done. This would be the prerequisite for doing any undergrounding to do this engineering report. And since Old Town and Monterey Vista are the main drivers of the whole underground, I don't know if you know, there is a whole website being devoted to undergrounding Monterey and uh, it's called montereyundergrounding.net I believe you can go there and uh, there's a they I there's been a lot of work on what it takes to underground how to fund it and everything else and the first step was to do any kind of to do an engineer report so this was to do it for Old Town and Monterey Vista then go on and do it for other because that's where the big push is and uh, to do it for others, but that's the engineering report that's required. So you're saying, you no, know, we don't have that report. You looked for it. Right. There okay. is hey, that hey, is. Jamie, originally, I believe what was funded was a report for New Monterey, and that was going to be used as a template for everyone else. Okay. That I, makes I think it's is what we're all kind of remembering. Okay. Okay, perfect. And then um, towards the end there on CW53, the Proposal talks about study or implementation. I think we're going to need the submitter to decide exactly what they want by voting night, you know, whether it's just a study or if they want more. We know what we're funding. Um, and just an interesting question a CW62 vet parks, repairs, and repairing of the basketball court. Is there any sort of um, neighborhood uh, approval that needs to happen when you change? I mean, is that a significant use that will cause traffic and other implement in effects that needs to be considered? Well, that's it's uh, supported by a all the people that play it. That it's a kind of it's very well removed from residences other than the park ranger, but the park ranger is totally in support of that. Um, 60 and 62 are kind of redundant. Um, 60 and 62 are both, 60 was submitted before the big tree that was in the way that kind of blocked there came down. That tree has been died and has been taken down. So 62 is basically expanded to a full half court up there. Right. Um, I'm not sure what, how parks and rec rates this, but that was by the people who play up there, play basketball up there is highly recommended. And it's also away from houses. So it's not very noise and uh, uh, it's not affecting neighborhoods. And I'm the submitter for at least the second project. <laughs> so I know it, I'm been working up there with a park ranger. Okay, cool. And one last question. Um, so 60 and 62 can be kind of combined. I don't know whether we have 60 crossed off. Yes. It's done. Yeah. Well, it's not really done, but okay. Right. Was, they, they use the funding for that, that for the bocce ball access path or something. Yeah. So uh -huh. we closed that one. There's no yeah. funding when it was deallocated, there was no funding left. So Louis like, okay, don't just will include that work in 62. So they it, they were similar and he's going to do it under 62. What was the price again for 62? I, I missed that. 62. Uh, 62,000. 
62. Okay. Thank you. 64. 64. I can't read my handwriting. Okay. And then the last question is on citywide, uh, community wide 64, Veterans Park intersection. That would seem to be something that should be covered in a traffic study before we get involved. So is there a traffic study in this area? Because in the past, we've gone back and said, well, you have to have a study first before we do something. This, I don't remember ever traffic study. Yesterday. My understanding is this is for the study. Yeah. Because one of the, I, the problem is you have the group two campground on one side of the road with little kids having to cross that road or on the uphill, there's no stop sign at all little kids cross the road to use the restrooms. And uh, so the idea is it's all wide right now with these huge turning radiuses. So cars tend to whip through there. And as to one idea was there might be enough place up there to actually put a little mini roundabout up there to get cars to slow down, but to put proper crosswalks in for the group two campers that camp there as well as residents that walk up there. But um, right now, that is morning traffic is pretty fast through there. And uh, but you my understand this is not to do it, but this is a study to go about doing. It. This is for the design of the intersection. Or, yes. Without the study or. Well, the study would be included in it. Yeah. But okay. it, wouldn't, it may not a study and necessarily design. require like an official like traffic counts and all that sort of thing we're just trying to improve the geometry of the intersection so my question my only question about this project is if it were to go a roundabout i remember the discussions about the roundabout that the roundabout is much as much more complicated in designing would this eighty thousand dollars include if it went to a mini roundabout would that be would that then go much higher or would that still be at 80,000? Uh, I will let you know. <laughs> okay. uh, I'll find, I'll have an answer for the, for you no. before the next meeting. All right, That's thank it. you very much. Okay, that, any basket. other? Yeah, one, one last comment. Uh, Jamie, when we had the van tour up at uh, Jack's Park, the tree that was in the way and all that stuff, we are short of basketball courts. We can use every damn basketball court you can find. Any place we can cheaply enlarge one to make it more usable, boy, we ought to jump on that. Because when we had the basketball court that is the one we have down there, and I mean, that's used at night. And of course, there's no lights on the one at Betts Park, but it would get used during the day. So that, I mean, and, and as I recall in the van tour, they had a couple guys playing basketball to show how it was used. Before Rich Richard. Yes, uh, I, I want to refer to Citywide 5, the, um, the video security plan. Uh, Tom and I sponsored a project to put a camera on the Sarah statue in the Presidio. And it was quite an involved project. We managed to get the camera put up, but uh, we were planning to go to the other city art structures, such as the grizzly bears and anything that's vulnerable to vandalism. Uh, so we did that study way back when. So I don't know if this is a redundancy, um, but we went over all the, the obstacles for cameras and viewing and transmission and all that. So I hate to have that all redone again, but um, Tom could check on that camera up at the Sarah statue on the Presidio. Uh, I know we had meetings with uh, city staff over this. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is the beach mats. A nonprofit recently took on the job of installing two of those mats. I don't want to do redundancy in the same location. So can you check to see what they've done? It was in the Herald. Uh, about a month ago. Thanks, Steve. Dave. Yeah, on the cameras, didn't didn't we approve a project for uh, monitoring an RV storage lot over by um, I don't know if it was Delray Oaks area, but in Monterey, 
but I thought we did one there too. That was, that was the one. Oh, I'm sorry, Rick. Go ahead. Good. No, go ahead, Tom. I was just going to say that that was on the list. We did go. We kind of blasted through it, but that's another one. Um, it's a project. It was funded. It got defunded. So now we're back considering it again. But the the city doesn't. There is no policy for installing cameras to record in public spaces right now. So that that's the issue, to my understanding. That's what Mr. Krebs told me. Um, is that we need a policy before installing cameras where we're recording people in public spaces. Does the city have a policy prohibiting them? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Yes, as far as I know, they do because the the um, they had project they had a problem up in Veterans Park, and they wanted to put a camera on the lockbox where people dropped their money that had gotten broken in several times, and they were basically told flat no. Okay, uh, Luz. Rick? Yes. Uh, I was just uh, thinking that the, the main reasons for whatever we are doing right now, the main reason would be uh, to promote safety with our projects, right? And then also to promote improvements for the hospitality, which creates what the money we are working on and also beautification, which is part of that, and the arts, and then also parks and activities, the library and events, all of that is focused on one, welcoming people and making them want to come back and safe and all that, and for us to use our money as wisely as possible. So if we are trying to do that with our neighborhoods, because we understand this pretty much. We have, it has been made very clear. Now, citywide as a whole, they need to work like that. You know, be careful not to repeat and have priority and we can all work it together and, and really accomplish our goals. That's all I have to say. Okay. Uh I got a want to make a comment on citywide 69. This is the oldest project in the history of NIT that's never been built but was funded at one point. This is the restrooms at Monterey Bay Park. Uh, I do not support turning this into a study. Uh, we did a lot of study. We had a lot of public in. And it has been needed every year since 1999 when we funded it originally. So, any other members of the committee have a question? I do have one from the, at least one from the public. Uh, Dennis, is that you raving two hands at me? <laughs> Jamie had one. And or Jamie, okay. If he, he's he's holding it for me um if anybody can send me any old notes or other items on the camera stuff then i'm going to get to work i did call some other cities and they do have cameras that are doing things like we want so anything any conversations we've had send them to me at my uh, nip email and i'll start working on it okay thank you jamie dennis did, were you waving for you too or just jamie no for tom for yep. jamie uh, hi, Rick. Uh, Tom Raleigh again. I attended, uh, I think with Brucella, but maybe not, uh, at least two years ago, perhaps three years ago, before the pandemic, I think the Arts Commission had a list of all the, art, all the valuable art projects and art stuff. And I remember looking at something with Jeff Krebs uh, up on uh, next to City Hall. Uh, he was trying to decide whether it should be included or not. And they had a meeting and they uh, had prioritized or started to, and then the pandemic, I believe hit. And all of that I think was put on the back burner, but somebody had, had made lists and this was at a meeting and they discussed it and they were, I don't think the list was ever finalized. Let's put it that way, that I recall seeing it. Yeah, so I hate to repeat everything all over again. Dennis. 
I was just directing traffic. I didn't have. A okay, question. thank you. That uh, that's a help because it's it's hard to see this really tiny picture of the. Uh, so Hans has okay. a question. I'll, okay, I'll, Hans. Um, two points on um, CW uh, sixty one, the Veterans Park bike path. We had that was just to refresh people's mind was the uh, was a that bike path to connect up from Veterans Hall where a lot of people go up to both Skyline as well as Vets Park. That was the most difficult part of the bike path, and we had quite a few on-site meetings there. And it's basically to get bikes off that steep, curvy road. Um, where they go up to Vets Park, where cars come around the curves and don't see the very slow bikes pedaling or even pushing their bikes uphill. And uh, this, since there's quite a few bikers in the summer who use the campground, as well as many people of us who ride up there, um, that path was to go through either to widen the road or to go through the woods. There's an equal number of several trees would need to get cut, cut down, but um, either one of those is uh, were feasible paths that were identified. And I'm not sure whether after that meeting, Tom, you ever got like drawings or notes from that, those meetings there, I can definitely talk to you more about that, where those two ideas were going and one of those would need to get chosen. But uh, that was, and the other was the, uh, the bocce ball court, CW 63 and that, um, the uh, park ranger himself said um, that he's talked to the, the few bocce ball players or that go up there where they'd like that court to be a little bit upgraded with a layer of DG on it. But uh, the park rangers talked to people and I think with a roller and a delivery of DG, he's willing to do that project. So um, that can be, uh, I think done quite a bit more efficiently. <laughs> Great. Good. Great. And that's all I have to say. Okay. Uh, anyone else in the council chambers on the dais who have a question? Lee and Dennis. Okay, Lee. Um, I would like to, I'm sorry, okay. were you first? Go ahead. No, Lee, go ahead. Okay. Ladies first. I'd like to speak to, um, they changed all the numbers here. Uh, CW41. Um, it's the, it's a major fuel reduction is needed in that old capital project part. Um, it was cleaned up one time before when we received it from Pebble Beach Company, but, um, and they've tried to maintain it, but the homeless keep moving back in there. And um, right now you can only go in there with a police escort because it is a closed open space park. But the, the, if a fire would just be started in there, with the winds we've been getting because we're high up on the hill, that would spread so fast and un would be uncontrollable, particularly in the neighborhood surrounding that on Glenwood Circle. There's several older buildings that are wood structures that would spread over to um, the adjacent Aquahito neighborhoods that would spread like wildfire. And um, let's not forget, we have the hospice um, in that area up there. And it's a beautiful open space. We need to get it cleaned up and move forward with it, get the master plan done and open it up to be a park. But it's in danger right now. We all are in danger because of all the trees in there and how bad it is. And it needs real bad cleaning in there. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lee. Dennis? So on that, I think it was CW61 with the... Uh, bike path going up into Veterans Park. The other thought I had was take that sh sharp corner that's uphill from this picture, which has about a 14 to 16 degree altitude and then turns and there's some scrubby little trees in there and widen that and straighten it out. So my proposal was to make this a study of how that should be laid out and not necessarily a construction project at this point um, because it's going to take a while to design it and then construct it in the next go around since there's so many projects to look at. And okay. I don't know who the submitter was. I can't remember if it was me or you. Yeah, it's one of us. <laughs> one of us bikers who's gone oh, up around that corner. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, any other one in Jamie? Was I seeing your hand waving again? Wayne. 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 Oh, okay. No, uh, I just wanted to go back to uh, Project 13 on that accessibility map. It's got to be out all the time. You don't know when someone who needs it is going to do it, and you can't ask them to unroll it. So, and talking to the uh, supplier of this material, basically the only time other cities have had issues is if there's been a major storm. You know, some of them just flat leave them out. They come up with a device to lift them up and the sand drops down through it. So then it's back on top or you can roll them up. But, uh, and I'll check out this uh, nonprofit that has put something out already, yeah. but okay. But yeah, basically they stay out there and a lot more people than those that need it, use it. They love it because <laughs> they're not stomping through soft sand. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, we ready to go out to the to the public? So, okay, Tammy Jennings followed by Clementine. Tammy? Go ahead. Am I unmuted? You're unmuted. Okay, thank you, sorry. Um, yes, I am the one that uh, submitted for the beach mats. And yes, thank you, Dwayne, for uh, explaining that people that are in wheelchairs cannot unroll the mats. And what I submitted was for uh, permanently installed mats along the um, beach house and at Del Monte Beach. And they would go all the way out from the hard pan to, or the bike trail to the soft pan and the sand does filter through and uh, even the grading or uh, what am I trying to say? You guys have like lawnmowers but that clean the beaches or something. It, it, you can roll over the top of them. It won't hurt anything. So if you, should I have the gentleman who came the first time to explain everything come back during the um, presentation area uh, day, is that something I should do to explain it better or not? I don't know. Uh, to me, it never hurts to have clarity. Okay, I'll see if they can come back. So thank you. Yeah. And if, and again, I expected them to stay put because I thought that that was one of the requirements that we had to have something that is actually installed and not something that can be removed. That was one of the requirements for the NCIP. That would be my understanding as well, Tom. So if you could just get clarification on if we can even do it if they're not installed permanently. Okay, hey, anything else, Ms. Jennings? And no, that's it, thank you. Thank you, uh, Clementine. Uh, Hi. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, excuse me. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, um, thanks, I just wanted to put a quick plug in for the um, accessibility in baby expression swings at Dennis the Menace. They hope that you may end up voting for it. And if so, I hope you all come down and swing on them. Thanks so much. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, is there anyone in the uh, council chambers in the public? Yes. Go ahead, please introduce yourself for the record and go ahead. Yes, hi, my name is Carrie Ann and I am the one that submitted the uh, honor garden for the police and fire department. Thank you again for giving me a, a brief second, but. Um, in hearing that the project was definitely agreed upon and approved, but there was some disagreement in the artwork that was going to be installed. I'm happy and more than happy to work with the art commission and probably tweaking that, resubmitting something, but I don't want that to hold up the, um, the honor that would be installed for the police and fire department with this particular garden. And also I know for a fact, this is on a separate, separate subject, your, um, 
uh, security uh, cameras and stuff. I know for a fact that there are other cities around you here in Monterey that do have, in fact, the building that I work with, uh, we have cameras outside the buildings that are viewing everyone. I've been told by several police departments that there's nothing legally that prevents you from putting cameras outside buildings because otherwise no one would be able to use their iPhone and film people in cars and all that stuff. That would be pr pr prohibited. So it is legal to be able to have something that you can film and use for security. While some people may not like it, there are cameras around that are used in other cities. And thank you very much. And this has been actually fun tonight. Thank you. Thank you. What question? Okay, any other public in the council chambers? Uh, coming back to the commission, I'm seeing April waving her hand. I just had a quick question for the lady who's in favor of the uh, garden. I remember when this was first presented, maybe somebody else can help me out. There was great enthusiasm, I believe, on your part. You were going to raise money. You had other places or agencies or organizations that would help raise money for this. Were you successful at that? Um, we we were trying to, but then COVID hit, and so everything kind of got shut down. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm hoping that we can get the funding through this organization. But uh, you know, we can always try. I mean, I think in the when we first started out, I think I have like nine hundred dollars that is in the Honor Garden Fund that's still sitting there, and <laughs> that's what we had so far. Then it uh, was shut down because of COVID, and no one could go anywhere, not even to the bank and yeah. stuff for work. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Lee. I um, think I'm seeing an arm up. Mentioned on the sidebar that Carrie Ann is also responsible for the memorial that is in the Devendorf Park in Carmel. There was actually firemen that went back east, went to Staten Island, and were able to pick the a piece of metal from the structures from one of those buildings that came down and they did, went on their own and they brought it back. And that's a memorial in the park in Carmel in downtown, the major park and Carrie Ann brought, made that happen. Thank you. And if I could add to that, the, the part of the bronze that was created actually has two of your uh, firemen that are currently with Monterey Fire Fires uh, Association, or it's not even called that right now, right? It's Monterey Fires? Fire department. Um, actually, Kenny Hutchinson is one of them, and there are two hands. It was a, it's the Brotherhood of Man reaching out to help your neighbor or help each other. So those two hands are in that bronze, um, and that was the part that is so powerful when you drive by and the light hits it at night to see those hands reaching out and just holding each other and helping each other. And that was the focus of the bronze. So I'm thinking there might be a way that we can tweak that. That the art association or committee would would appreciate and accept it. But that was basically the inspiration for the artist was to see these men give up their own time, go all the way back to New York and reach out and help each other. And it wasn't for that, but it was just more about how these guys are in our community and this is what they do for us. So that's why the hands are important, but if they didn't want the rest of the sculpture, that's fine. We can work with the artist and he can, you know, reattach it or do something, but it's a very beautiful bronze of just these two massive hands reaching out to help each other. Okay. The man. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's bring it back to the committee. And I, Richard, you have your hand up? Yes. Uh, I wanted to mention the security camera issue in the study. Uh, Carmel uh, actually is the only city they installed a half dozen cameras at their entry and exit to their city. And they have solved many, multiple major crimes with those license plate cameras. And it's very successful there. Our police chief recommended that to the council three, four years ago. It may be time because it affects the public art and affects the Del Monte Beach project, but they can also put them on our major streets at our entry and uh, they can track bank robbers, they did rapist in Carmel. They were successful. And it's the software that does it. That's the most important part. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, I, I am not seeing other hands up or other 
uh, things. So we will close this part of the agenda. And I believe uh, next is a council or commission comments. Uh, anyone wish to have any uh, general comments? Uh, Rich, uh, Richard followed by Kurt. Yes, uh, my comment is uh, I've been taking notes, but there's so many projects, it's very difficult. Uh, I was wondering if Alyssa could send us an updated list, eliminating the completed projects, putting the prices on each project so that we get some kind of order here. My notes are a mess. So uh, just something before the next meeting that's more current than the previous list eliminating all the ones we don't have to look at. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Very good meeting. I, I'm, I'm gonna exactly say what Richard just said, but I'd like to see it in a spreadsheet. Plus also, Tom, is it possible you could send out these slides because they're helpful also? Yes, absolutely. Okay. J uh, does anyone on the dais have their hand up? Because I don't see anyone. Okay. Wayne has his hand Wayne, up. Wayne, okay. Up. Yes. Uh, the issue about NCIP, NIP, uh, puzzled me for a while. So I went and looked at the city charter. Article 6, Section 6, NCI, uh Neighborhood Community Improvement Program, sections A, B, and C, Neighborhood Improvement Community Program, section D and E, NIP, strictly. So I don't know why we were such bad folks as far as the grand jury was concerned, but <laughs> you're in the charter. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys. Okay. Uh... Anyone else? If not, we will adjourn. Seeing no others, I'd say. Okay, seeing no others, we are adjourned at a rifle.